Hey everybody, this is Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner, Audio, Audio, Audio Corner, Audio Corner, and today I'm going to review the Dayton Dats V3. Now, this is a product, and I believe, I'm not even going to call it a product, man, it really it is, is a tool. If you are into audio as a hobbyist, if you are into it as a professional, you build enclosures, you test speakers, whatever, this is a tool that everyone should have in their toolbox. If you own a set of wire strippers, seriously. You need to own these. Now, if you're just playing around with speakers every once in a blue moon, okay, maybe you don't have to have one. But if you play around with speakers more than a couple times a year, if you ever build enclosures, if you design passive crossovers, the Dayton Dats V3 is bar none a tool that you really and truly should own. And I'm not just saying it because I'm going to throw an affiliate link, which, hey, I'm going to throw an affiliate link if you want to buy one and help the channel out. But seriously, I've owned the Dayton Dats products for years, even before it was called the Dats, it was just called the Woofer Tester. And it is an invaluable tool in your toolbox. I've used it for numerous things, um, testing out drive units because I didn't know what the TS parameters were. So I needed to sweep it and find them out myself. Putting a driver in an enclosure to see if the vent tuning is what I wanted it to be. So say I designed a ported enclosure for 56 hertz tuning and I put the drive unit in and it was higher or lower. Well, I could tell that easily by just looking at the impedance sweep. Another thing that you can do with it and it is an invaluable tool to have is to check resonances in an enclosure. So let's say you bought a pair of speakers and you're listening and something just doesn't sound right. Well, it's really hard to separate a speaker from a room, especially low frequency. In order to do that, you would have to take it outside. You would have to have the right measurement gear. And most people probably just aren't able to do that or don't know how to do that. But with a Dayton Dats, you can certainly roll out some basic things really, really quickly by just doing a basic impedance sweep. And if you see a blip in the impedance, then you know that's an internal resonance of some sort, either from standing waves in the cabinet or port tuning, or maybe even the drive unit itself that are used in the enclosure. But it helps you separate one piece from the puzzle to determine what is actually going on. And in this video, I'm going to provide you guys with some samples and examples of what I mean on those topics. So with that said, let's go ahead and jump into it. I don't want to make this video a comparison from the new Dayton Dats V3 versus the previous Dayton Dats V2 but I will provide some basic comparisons. And in that, what I will say is that here is what the two look like side by side. And you can see that the Dayton Dats V2, which is in my right hand, so it would be your left, is quite a bit smaller. It is a plastic shell, whereas the Dats V3 is a metal shell. And if I tap it with my ring, you can hear it. It's, uh, it is indeed metal. It's just very solid, very, very well built. It really and truly feels like a true professional grade tool as opposed to, and I hate saying it, but this just feels more like a toy. And another thing that I really do like about the new DATS is that the previous DATS required you to use an included 1K ohm resistor in order to calibrate the unit every time you used it or pretty much every time you used it. And, you know, it's really not a big deal. It's, it doesn't take a long time to do or anything, but it's just, you know, one extra thing to keep up with. You know, if you lose this and you got to go somewhere and they don't have Radio Shacks really around anymore. So you're going to have to order one online and have to wait a few days. Whereas with the V3, you have the leads right on the front. So right there. So that is your 1K ohm resistor that is built in. Well, that's nice. Another thing going back to the V2 is you can see that previously it used the USB cord permanently attached to the unit. Whereas now the V3 has a port for the USB. So if your dog, for instance, got a hold of your DATS uh, and ruined the cable, okay, no big deal. You just replace it with another USB B, I think, port on this and you're good to go. And that's going to be it for the comparison. If you wanted to read more about the main differences, such as the power advantages that the V3 has and, and other things, uh, tighter tolerances that the V3 has, you can certainly do that. Just go to Dayton Audio's website and read all about it there, but I don't want to make this a big deal between the comparison. I'm going to focus on the actual functionalities that I prefer to use this for and why I think everybody should own one of these products. Years back when I built my home theater, I purchased a set of cabinets that were from JBL Pro that had four drivers total in two different cabinets. 
And they actually came from the old Cinemark in town. A church bought them out. They didn't need the stuff, so the sound guy was selling all the old stuff. I got lucky. I picked everything up. And what I did was I gutted those cabinets, and I took three of those drivers, and I used them for my front LCR in my home theater. But obviously, I didn't know what the parameters were in order for me to build new cabs, so I needed to use the DATS. I think I had the V2 at the time, and I used that to sweep the drive unit and get the TS parameters, and then I modeled an enclosure using those parameters, and then I built the enclosure, and I then swept the enclosure with the drive unit in it to make sure that the port tuning was correct, and I was good to go. So I've got an extra drive unit sitting around. This is kind of just in case I ever need it to recone one of the other ones or something happens with one of the other ones. And I thought it'd be a good opportunity to test this out and to share with you guys the basic functionality and one of the main uses for the DATS. And with that said, let's go ahead and start hooking it up. Now I've got the DATS sitting here on my table. He's plugged up to my computer and I'm going to connect the leads to the drive unit and let's see we'll give it a sweep nope let me reconnect do, 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 do. okay ta-da and that's it now in this case i'm blocking the rear port or the rear vent and you know obviously if you're really ideally measuring a drive unit you should have it something like that in the in the way that it's going to be used and you should not block the basket you should not block the vent or anything like that but since this is just a demonstration it's okay because i definitely don't want to try to hold this up with one hand while i'm testing it what this does is it gives you the basic ts parameters so it gives you re gives you fs gives you qts but then you're going to need mms you're going to need vas and you're going to need bl so to test those what you would do is you would use the uh, additional mass method or if you know the uh, what is it what all do we need here um yeah if you know the box volume that you're going to use and you can put the drive unit in there there's a couple different ways to get those parameters i'm not going to do that here i just want to provide you with a very basic test case and if you want to read more about that you certainly are welcome to do so but there's a lot of people that talk about how to use those different methods and uh, we're not really going to get into that here today you can see on the screen what we have here is the FS portion, which is about 48 hertz. And the QTS, which you can find over here, is measured at about 0.3455. Now these little guys right here, those are most likely due to me having the pull piece uh, vent blocked. So I wouldn't pay much attention to those in this particular example. But you can see how this tool is really helpful because it gives you some, some basic information. The uh, RE is listed here, FS, QTS, all those things are listed on the side. And, and again, if you were to go the next step, which is to use the um, added mass method or the sealed box method to determine the VAS and the BL, then you could take that information and use it in something like WinISD or Basebox Pro or one of your other subwoofer type modeling programs. Okay, another way that you can use the DATS is to sweep an enclosure with the drive units in it to see where the tuning frequency is, and we're going to do that here. Now, I've got the DATS connected already, so I'm going to hit run. If I can see around the speaker, holy cow, guys. All righty. All right, so that's the sweep for this speaker. This is the Eclipse Heresy 4 speaker. Now we've got on the screen the impedance sweep result from the Eclipse Heresy 4. And in this example, what I was trying to determine was the tuning frequency of the enclosure. Because it's a ported enclosure, what you will expect is to see two larger impedance bumps. And then you'll see the trough in the middle is going to be the tuning frequency. And that trough should also line up to the zero degrees phase so the phase is this top line and if you look down here where i've clicked i'm at approximately zero degrees phase so the tuning frequency of this enclosure is at about 35 hertz and okay cool now you know so let's say you were building an enclosure with a drive unit like we discussed previously now you would know when you put it in hey this is the targeted tuning frequency and you know i, I hit what i wanted to hit or i did not This speaker is a really good example of a case to use the DATS V3 to find resonances in an enclosure. The reason I say that is because when I was reviewing the speaker a few months back, 
there was some lower male vocals that really seemed to light up when I was playing them. And I wasn't sure if it was the room. I was pretty sure that it wasn't. But when I went to actually measure the speaker, I found out that there is a impedance blip around the 110 hertz, 120 hertz region, which we'll talk about shortly. And where that occurred was right where I was hearing the very unnatural, uh, boomy, just resonance. It's like a, it sounded like, instead of me talking like blah, 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 it sounded like and it was just super annoying. And once I heard it, it was one of those things that I could never un unhear again. And because of that, that was one reason why no matter the lineage, no matter, you know, the coloration and frequency response, even if I liked all of those things about this speaker, the low frequency resonance from the enclosure itself drove me nuts. And I would, I would never buy the speaker for that reason. Since I was able to determine that it was the speaker itself and not from the room, that led me to determine, I guess, that it would be a speaker that I would not personally enjoy because something like that, you can't just EQ out. And when you hear it, you can't unhear it. And it would have driven me nuts. If I bought this pair of speakers and I paid full retail for them, I probably would have been pretty upset because they're like 3K retail price. So I don't want to get into the actual review of that speaker. If you want to see that review, I'll link it up here, I guess, somewhere and you can click that. And anyway, so let's talk about the internal resonance from this speaker and, and talk about why I could hear that. In this example, we're still again looking at the Klipsch Heresy 4. And the area that I noticed of resonance, I noticed it being in the lower, I, I think I ballparked it between 100 to 150 hertz in my subjective listening tests. And when I went and looked at the measurements, this is what I saw, this guy right here. So I'm going to highlight him, this area around the 110, 120 ballpark. Let's see what that is, 120.5. Now that blip is what I'm calling, I'm calling it a blip. What you should expect to see is a smooth dip in this response or in this impedance sweep. And any kind of anomalies that make this behave uh, non-curvilinear, I guess if we wanna call it that, are indications of resonance typically. And in this case, what what I'm hearing is exactly what I'm seeing in the data. There is a very strong pronounced resonance right here at about 120 hertz. And let me tell you, when you when you hear it, you absolutely hear it. It's not something that you think, oh well, data doesn't matter. It you know, it doesn't matter what the data is showing me. I'm not going to hear it. No, trust me, you absolutely hear this frequency. You hear the resonance from it, and the data easily shows you. So you wouldn't have to go and get anechoic measurements. You could easily just run an impedance sweep with the DATS and then say, ah, that's the region I was here, and that's got to be the issue. Now, you could try to start fixing it. If this is a true standing wave, then you would have to somehow change the internal geometry. Um, if it's wall flexing or something like that, then additional bracing would probably help that, or you could use additional acoustic stuffing if you needed some. Now, this speaker itself the one that I tested, I'll throw up an internal shot of it right now. And as you can see, there is no internal bracing in this in this speaker. So $3,000 for a pair of speakers like this, they're just boxes. There's no internal bracing, and this is what you get out of it. So I was not happy when I heard that. But again, it's an example of how you can use the DATS to quickly eliminate variables. With all of that said, my final conclusion is, I said it before, I'll say it again. This is an incredible tool to own. It is a very powerful tool. It makes life so much easier when you're troubleshooting. If you have an unknown, it helps you get those unknowns and make them knowns. And it's about 130 bucks. Now, I mean, yeah, in the budget DIY world, that's not cheap, but in the long run, it will pay for itself. I have been using these for years. I've helped me, it, they have helped me tune a periodic enclosures. They've helped me, um, you know, just break in speakers by using the generation that it has on it. So you can do sine sweeps, uh, you can do pink noise generation, actual just sine tones, and that will exercise the suspension a little bit if you want to do that. Uh, you can hook them up to an actual set of loudspeakers and exercise suspension and loudspeakers. So there are a whole lot of uses for this product, and I truly highly recommend that you purchase it. If you want to purchase it through one of my affiliate links, man, that would be awesome. That would be a, a big help to me. But if you don't, hey, whatever, it's okay. Just make sure you Google it and, and find the link that way. And with all of that said, I appreciate you watching. Please subscribe and like. And if you have comments, you have questions, make sure you leave them down below. I will do my best to answer them in a timely manner. And if I can't, maybe somebody else in the community can. 
So again, I appreciate you watching and that'll be it for me. You guys take care. Peace. Of course, now that I have the DATS V3, I don't really have a use for the DATS V2. So I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. If you follow my Facebook group already, go to my Facebook page, keep an eye out there for the next couple days. And what I'm gonna be doing is I'm going to throw this up as a free giveaway and I'm not gonna ask you to do any sort of crazy uh, nonsense. I'm just going to ask you to like the post so I can keep track with everybody's names and I will just send you my old V2. You can have it. Um, you know, just kind of pay it forward for all the support that I get from you guys. So yeah, if you're a part of that group, go ahead and, and go over there and join. And if you don't do Facebook, I get it, but that's the easiest way for me to keep track of things. So that's what I'm asking you to do.